Yes. <laughs> and we have it numbered right up here so that you'll know how many revelations you've had. <laughs> Uh, but I want to begin in the book of John, before we get further into the things we've been discussing in the book of Revelation. So if you would, turn with me to John chapter 16. And um, while, while you are turning there, I will remind you that, um, you know, we, we were discussing how the early church after the resurrection of Christ, they expected certain things to happen because of their ex expectation of the coming of Messiah and what that would mean. And many Christians today, I mean, even, even that, they'll shout in church, you know, that, that, you know, and they'll have big praise and worship sessions um, about how we got the victory and everything, but in a very real way, and, and we do. And I even Sunday, or last, the last time I preached on Sunday, I, I encouraged that. but. Um, there, is, um, there is a reality that they had to face that we have to face, and that is that uh, we, you know, we suffer the same kind of situations they do. If the, if the world has a financial crisis, that it, it tends to affect us, if, or, or the country has one, and um, you know, we're not uh, exempt from physical problems and on and on and on. Well, theirs was even bigger than that because they thought that God was going to just take over and that he was going to raise up Israel and they would never have any um, uh, financial problems and that Israel would be raised not only above the Romans but above everyone. And um, <clears throat> so there was a lot of confusion because of all the oppression and stuff that continued after the resurrection that actually got worse. And uh, so the church really became in need of answers. I mean, for them really it was desperate because the Romans were, you know, hunting them like dogs and the Jews, you know, for example, you know, Paul uh, or Saul of Tarsus, he was hunting them. And um, uh, so they needed some deeper explanations um, and and really and truly, they needed a deeper explanation of what the crucifixion of Christ meant. Um, and, um, you know, that they needed new definitions uh, in so many areas, but they had to be brought to a point where they would be open to that. And um, one of those new definitions was God's definition of victory. <clears throat> what that really meant to the Lord. Um, and of course, most people call the resurrection the victory. And yet, the New Testament emphasizes the cross. Um, and uh, I won't go through all the scriptures that, that show that and everything. And certainly there was... There was victory in the resurrection. But as far as God's victory, God's victory, because he didn't need, he didn't need saving from hell. He didn't need, God didn't, not the Father. He didn't need saving from hell. He didn't need to, to you know, all the benefits of righteousness and, you know, all this sanctification. He didn't need all that. The Father already had all that and more. I mean, he was, he was totally, he was that. I mean, it was inbuilt into his being. So what the victory was for God was wrapped up more in the cross than in the resurrection because the resurrection at the resurrection was manifest all of the things that, <clears throat> um, that we uh, treasure, if you will, if I can put it that way. And um, so let me just quickly read a few things and, and um, then I'll read our scripture here. Under confusion and oppression and despair, the early church was in need of answers. It would require deeper examination of the crucifixion of their Messiah, along with a new explanation for the continued and ongoing oppression and distress that they lived under before they had become open, before they will become open to new definitions of what victory meant in God's terms. And if there was ever to be a shout of victory among them, that victory would have to come by means of a new definition 
of power because their circumstances were worse than before they met Jesus. And they were all aware of this and they had been, you know, they had been pressed into um, facing certain things. All right. Here's what I mean by that. <laughs> you can live as a happy-go-lucky Christian for a long time. And you can have God bless you and things going fairly good. I mean, everybody has little trials and stuff along the way and going pretty good. And there are certain things that, that for example, in this place might be said in this place or even where you're at, that, uh, wherever that is, um, that those things, you don't have to accept those. You don't even have to become open to those because you really have no reason. The only reason why you would do that apart from pressure would be you just have to, you just happen to have a heart after God and you're pursuing him and, and you, you read what his word says and you go, oh my God, that's saying something different than what I've been taught. But that doesn't come along very often. So what God has to do is he has to bring about certain pressures, circumstances, uh, distresses, things that make us go, wait a minute, you know, now, you know, I mean, am I so wonderful, <laughs> you know? Is, do, do I really understand this? And again, uh, um, you know, and I've said this several classes back, but the cliches don't work when you're in that situation. And, and honestly, you even get a little shocked at uh, some of the things that you threw out to other people who were in trials when you never had been and you get a little shocked and maybe even embarrassed within yourself of what you'd said you know who knows 10 years ago or whatever <clears throat> and um, so uh, God and, and when you read the book of Revelation one of the things that becomes just evident if you really look at it and most Christians don't most Christians think of the book of Revelation as this out of control devil, this out of control red dragon and his antichrist and his false prophet and they're just wreaking havoc on the earth. That's not the case at all. I mean, it's not. If you, if you read, really read the book of Revelation, you're going to see that God's letting most of this stuff loose. It doesn't change them. They're going to do their part. You know what I mean? They're going to do what's natural in them. They're going to, you know, they're going to cause trouble. Um, but most of the stuff that's flying at the earth, most of the stuff that's even flying at the Christians, is not the devil. It's coming from God. All right. Well, you know, that right there, that's, that flies in the face of a whole lot of, you know, spirit-filled, charismatic type Christians because, you know, I mean, it doesn't matter that I'm, I'm saying that based on the Bible. And if you get into the Word, in the book of Revelation, you'll see it doesn't matter that. What matters is that's not what they've been taught. So there must be something wrong. But let me tell you, I'm telling all of you, don't listen to me. I mean, don't, you know, it, hear what I say, but go to the Word and go to the Bible and ask the Lord to open your eyes. Because if you don't, in one ear and out the other. And it'll be that way as long as you're just loping along in your life. You have no reason to turn and you won't. You have no reason to be broken and you won't be. You have no reason to be of a contrite heart and you won't be. Hence, the book of Revelation. <laughs> and these guys, see, we start our suffering in the book of Revelation on deep into the book, into the chapters where the real outward trouble starts. The Jews and more importantly, the first church, the early church, they started it right from the beginning and that's why John started and said, your brother in tribulation, in other words, somebody who knows what you're going through is writing this unto you, not somebody who's above it, not somebody who's escaped it, not somebody who has more power over, but somebody who knows exactly where you're at and what you're going through. And uh, 
and I'm with you in that instead of trying to get you with some glorious victory and they start right off in the first three chapters suffering dealing with with Satan dealing with breaches of uh, I say breaches of I, I'm, I picture in my mind Nehemiah and Ezra building the temple and building the walls and uh, Sanballat and Tobiah and all their people breaching and breaking through the wall of the temple and the walls of the city. Those things, that's not just an Old Testament story. That is what's going on in your life if you're not building the walls. Okay, well, what does that mean? Doesn't mean anything until the enemy has broke through your walls and starts wreaking havoc on you. Then you'll be open, and the time to have been open is way before that. However, the Lord is merciful. And if you turn to him, he'll turn to you. And if you're if you didn't listen or you didn't you didn't you know, when I say listen, you didn't say, Lord, whatever truth is in that, work it in me by life, that it may be Christ, that it may be a sweet incense of Christ to you. If you didn't do that, and you probably didn't do that a lot, <clears throat> and the walls are breached, and the, the foreigners are coming over your walls like mad, and you can't control them, the Lord is still merciful, <laughs> incredibly merciful. The only difference is you're going to have to, you know, some of you have been around a while, remember my example. You know, if the devil knocks on the front door and he's got a bag of snakes and he says, let me in, and you just open it a little bit and he throws that bag of snakes in there, well, just by opening that door a little bit, it may take you two weeks or a month to get all those snakes out of your house. You, you know. Um, if you don't, and nobody can talk you into this. There's no, you know, it's not, it's not my goal to talk you in, into it. My goal is to present the book of Revelation and, and what, comes by God and also by, by uh, the people because they weren't fully aligned with the Lord. And that's John 16, verse 12. Jesus says this, I have yet... This, now, one thing you have to remember, Jesus is about, is about to leave. He's about to be crucified, but more than that, he's going to disappear off the planet as far as what they, uh, how they knew him. All right? Now, what does that tell us, first of all? That tells us that in order to get Jesus the way you really need him, the Jesus that you may presently know may have to disappear on you. <laughs> I mean, there, you may have to give up a lot of the Jesus that you thought was Jesus that is really more what you've been taught uh, and what you've perceived and really the aspects of Jesus that you like that you've joined to yourself and you fell in love with aspects that you like when in fact maybe some of those aspects are not really even the way that he is. <clears throat> so he says, I must go away, you know. Anybody remember this phrase, I must, you must be born again. And, and how important, how emphatic is the word must, that you must be born again? It's, it's pretty doggone important, wouldn't you say? <clears throat> Jesus says, I must go away so that the Holy Spirit 
can come and give you new definitions and new understandings based on eternal reality and not based on a God of your temporal needs. Now, again, you can read into that, you know, what things I'm not saying. I'm not saying he didn't care about your temporal needs. I know he does. I mean, we got two little babies, two little twin boys from Cassie, and they've been just going through incredible problems. And at the same time, Deb's still got a hurt foot, and, you know, just all of this stuff. And, and I get phone calls constantly, you know, five in the morning, whatever, you know, and sometimes calls from the Lord when, you know, nobody is calling me, but constantly to pray. There's this, there's that, there's this, there's that. I believe the Lord takes care of us. I believe he cares. I believe he, but that's not, that can't be my definition of him. Because he was, you know, and you've heard me say this before, but if I, that's our definition of him, that he, that he heals us and that he protects our families and that he, he casts out the devil and all that, which is all wonderful and he does do that. But if that's our definition, then what was he before the world existed? When there were no demons to cast out, when there was no sickness, when there was none of, no world crisis or personal crisis going on, what was he? Well, he was... He was God, but he probably, since he, he's just a, a lump up there, that's why he created everything, because he didn't have anything to do. You know. No. There's a richness and a fullness to him that is not based on your temporal needs. There's only one way you're going to get that. You're going to have to be open that Jesus goes away. The, but it's really not Jesus going away. It's your concepts of him. And I'll, I'll show this to you probably in this class or the next class, scripturally, so that you can see it in a certain light. But uh, but when I went through that process, it was very, very difficult for me because when I, I'll just use these words, when I found the Lord, when the Lord found me, you know, when I found the Lord, because of my past and everything, it was the best thing by far that had ever happened to me, okay? And so I spent a, a while growing in the knowledge of a Jesus that I didn't even know the Holy Spirit was supposed to teach me anything, you know? And so when the time came to give up concepts of Jesus, to me, that was to give up Jesus. And how could I do that? You, know, you understand what I'm saying? I, I can't give up Jesus. I won't give up Jesus. No. And, and you're a rip-off person if you're trying to take Jesus from me. It's the best thing I've ever had. So whatever you're going through, I really doubt it's as strong as my, I was like a crazy man, you know. But somehow the Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, kept nudging me towards him and saying, just be open. I'll, I'll protect what is true and eternal. You be open for the Holy Spirit to show you if that's really a concept and not really Jesus, that, that, that you've been hugging concepts and go, I love you, Jesus. <laughs> you know, and it's got an arm full of concepts, you know. And um, well, with time, I found out that's exactly what was going on because Jesus said while he was with them, I have many things to say to you. And, you know, you're kind of going, well, you know, let's do it. <laughs> Tell me, Lord. Or, you're fixing to be gone? 
you know, and you're only here three and a half years, you know, we should have probably got down a little harder on this, you know, bore in, bore down a little more, you know, to get this. And he would have said to me, because I would have said that, <laughs> he would have said to me, uh, no, it's not really going to come that way. I must go away. And the Holy Spirit must come and give you the many things, many things that I have to say. All right. This is, this is the condition of the church, the, the uh, seven churches are, you know, representing all the churches. The seven churches of Asia, they have grasped him and grasped at him. But John, thy Jesus, is writing to them. And he's saying... You really hadn't got it by reading the Gospels. And you really didn't get it, really, by reading the epistles. And, you know, John's writing this. He goes, you know, I wrote that Gospel thing a long time ago. You know, Gospel of John. <laughs> he also wrote the book of Revelation. You know, I, you didn't get that. And then I wrote 1 John and 2 John. And, and Paul wrote stuff, and Peter wrote stuff. You still didn't get it. So we're going to put it in a completely different form. And this form is probably going to scare the fool out of you. But in reality, the seeds of the truth are there. And maybe that will be enough to move your heart and to soften your heart and to say, Lord, I want you. And Lord, I seek you, not just in service. You know, I mean, you, you, do, you understand what I mean when I say it, not just in service. The example of that would be the only time Pastor Randy gets into the Word is when he's got something to preach. Do you know what I'm talking about? I mean, if that was the case. <laughs> is that the case, Deb? <laughs> I don't, I don't. I seeking the Lord. I'm not seeking a sermon. Um, but there was a time in my life that I went through that I realized, you know, the only time I get in the Word is when I'm in church or when I've got to preach or when it's a, a called meeting of some kind. And that's when I'm warm and fuzzy with the Lord and the rest of the time I've pretty much got my own life. And I realized, you know, whether that's right or wrong, is not the, was not the issue so much as I can't do Jesus that way. I mean, I, I want, you know, what I meant was I, I couldn't say in the warm, fuzzy times in the gathering, I want you, Lord, and then get outside of those and not want you, Lord. Does that make sense? No. I'm not saying that to bring condemnation. Um, I don't remember hearing that myself, but if I had of at that time, I probably would have at least gone, hmm, maybe there's something to that, you know what I mean? I mean, just if, if nothing else, a quick prayer, hey, you know, if I'm that way, I don't want to be that way. That's better than nothing, isn't it, you know? And sometimes when we've been that way for a while, we feel sort of hard, hardened, not, you know, not hard, like mean hard, or, but just not pliable. That's what I mean. Not, we, we don't feel as pliable. So it's like, now I know this should be <laughs> affecting me. Anybody know what I'm talking about where you just kind of go now, mm, I know this should be affecting me. But you know, I'm really thinking about laundry right now, or something. Yeah. That wouldn't be my thought. But. <laughs> 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 I'm 
clearly not thinking about laundry much. <laughs> Especially since I'm just sitting around in one chair all day long, day after day after day. It's like, and she's off with the babies having to, you know, be there. And, and so it's like, well, these, these pants ain't too dirty. <laughs> You know, it's only been two weeks. You know. <laughs> but we all have our ways of slipping away. I mean, hey, let me give you all an example that I bet every one of us know. Have you ever come down to an altar call where everybody was like on their knees praying? And the point wasn't that the preacher was going to pray for you. You were just going to come down and seek the Lord for a little while, you know, and a bunch of people around you. And while you're there, you're praying. Or you could do this at home, you know, and then your bed before you go to sleep. Oh, Lord, you know, I really want to do I want you to move so and so. And your mind just goes off to something else. You go, and you're, you know, and you're, you're there and you're, you know, all of a sudden you go, oh, oh, you know, it's like, it's, it's a little, it's a little like talking to somebody like this. And then you just kind of go, and you know, uh, da, da, da. oh yeah, oh yeah, you, do you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's, it really is a little, and I, it's like, this is embarrassing. And I, I found myself doing it a bunch of times. I'm just going, what is wrong with me? <laughs> I mean, you know, and, you know, and, and it's like Jesus is sitting there going, yes, my child, you know, <laughs> you know, and you go, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, sorry, sorry, I got off on that, you know, and I spent more time on that than the last thing we just discussed, and in fact, we didn't, I just talked at you, but anyway, sorry, and he goes, okay, you know, go on, my child, <laughs> well, you know, and Lord, just help me with so-and-so, and, -so and you know, and then you just wander off again. Then you, then you realize you're way over there and you go, oh, and you walk back over and go, look, I'm sorry I left you just sitting here, <laughs> you know. I mean, I've done that where the next morning I realized I was in the middle of a prayer and he's probably still sitting there going, <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean, but <clears throat> it's just embarrassing. <laughs> yeah, and if you did that to a human being, they would hate you forever. <laughs> But see, we do it. We do it regularly because we go, well, "It's Jesus. He loves me." <laughs> Let me just say, you better dang well thank him that he thank, thank God that Jesus loves you <clears throat> and me. <laughs> All right. So uh, let me read a little more. While it took some time to transition, the early church eventually came to grips with a, with a view of their Messiah in a completely different manner than what they had previously been taught, starting with the 12 disciples, not, not even the early church, the 12 disciples. Because they had one view and they had to wake up to another one. For example, the disciples had a certain perception of what the cross meant. And of course, what it meant while it's taking place. You know, this is a disaster. We thought the kingdom was going to come. We thought this was it. You know, even, even on the road to Emmaus, two of the disciples walking along there. And, you know, Jesus draws near and they don't recognize him. And they said, we thought he'd been the one. We thought that he was going to change everything. We thought, we thought, we thought. <clears throat> um, so the disciples had certain perception of what the cross meant while it was taking place, but later had to readjust their thinking. After some time of discouragement, I want you to notice that. After a certain amount of time of discouragement, with what? With what they thought Jesus was going to do as the Messiah. With what they thought was going to happen. With what they thought they were going to get out of it. There was a certain amount of discouragement with the 12, just like with the seven churches. Okay? The disciples, after a certain amount of time of discouragement, the disciples were introduced to Jesus in a completely new light other than what he was formerly seen in. Their early discouragement was strictly due, their discouragement was strictly due 
to the wrong view and perception they had concerning what they thought was supposed to happen. Okay? Because, and answer me this. Did the cross go the way that God thought it would? Okay. Hmm. They didn't think that was right. They, in fact, they thought that was wrong. They thought this thing was going so well. How could it have ended so badly? Okay. Um, so after the resurrection, the disciples came to a new view of the death of Christ. A new awakening in thinking took place. Formerly, they had viewed the cross as the end of all that Israel had hoped for culminating in a tragic and untimely death for Jesus and for their ministry in the earth. Okay, now, this could happen to you. You could have pictures of what you think your ministry is going to be. And I'm sure if we ask everybody, you know, particularly we have some been around here for a long time, 20 years ago, what you thought your ministry would look like, it probably wouldn't be this. I'm guessing. And for me, too. Okay. Um, but if we ask you what you thought it was going to look like, I have a feeling it would be way more grandiose than probably what it would have been. Anyway, if, if everything had turned out good, probably what you had in mind, it wouldn't have been that good, you know. Um, it's like, you know, when you're a pastor, you're always dealing with problems and you're dealing with issues and stuff. And I've found... I've found that things are never as bad as people think they are, and things are never as good as people think they are. <laughs> that's, that's what I've found. And I've found that there's a balance in between there somewhere. Moderation in all things, a balance, you know, God hates an unequal balance, you know, and all that. That we're, all, we're you know, we tend to go one or the other or be, just be one particular way or, you know, they, some people they call optimists, you know. Um, you know. You, you're in a huge crisis and they always find the silver lining, you know. You're just kind of going, look, are you stupid? This is horrible, okay? There is no silver lining, you know. <laughs> but <laughs> nonetheless, <clears throat> it's better to just be with the Lord because if you're too overexcited and whatever, then you're going to get discouraged and if it doesn't work out the way you think and then you're going to get your little heart broke and then da -da 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 -da, and all this kind of stuff. And if it's, you get too low, then the enemy can get in and beat the fool out of you. So it's better, you know, what I find is instead of reacting to anything, I wait. I've learned to wait, you know. And somebody hit me in the face with something, uh, <clears throat> some tragic thing or whatever, Instead of, you know, reacting immediately or going, <gasps> you know, oh, my God, <clears throat> um, I've learned to just go, okay, well, let's pray about it, you know, or let's seek the Lord or, you know, but um, because an answer that you would be open to that may not be the Lord may come pretty quick. Just wait and just be patient and trust the Lord. A lot of times when I'm, I'm all, the, all the emotions over the situation are flushed out, then, I can, then it's like the Lord comes and I can hear clearly, you know. Um, and you've heard me say it before, but when people or circumstances are going, I got to know now, I got to know now, especially people that are, you know, it's, that's called haste, being hasty. You got you to do it now. You don't have to be this way. But I'm going to tell you how I am. Anybody that says you got to do it now, nine times out of ten, I ask more than that, probably 90 out of 100, you're not, I'm not going to move. So I'm, I'm even speaking to you who, you know, we don't have a lot of that around here. But if, you know, if you ever did, you wondered, 
probably your best chance of not getting me to move is to try to get me to move real fast. <laughs> Because I, I just, I've seen from the Lord that haste really isn't of the Lord and that it really leads to other bad stuff. You know, this is bad. Well, you be hasty and you got other bad stuff you're going to have to clean up too. So, anyway, I almost sound like a pastor tonight. <clears throat> oh, that's right. I am a, I'm a pastor. Okay. Um, so now... Uh, their view of the cross. Now they were to view Christ crucified as the beginning of a completely new approach. They soon saw that the cross was not the end of Christ and it was, not, was also not a victory for their enemies, which they thought. Okay. Now why wouldn't any of us think that, that something like that, something maybe we're going through, why wouldn't we think it's a, it, it's a, this is a victory for the enemy? There's only one way it won't be. <laughs> You're going to have to learn new definitions or it's going to be a victory for the enemy. But, it, but Jesus wasn't murdered. He was a willing sacrifice. They didn't murder him. Maybe in their hearts they did, and it says that in the book of Acts. You by wicked hands have crucified the prince of life, but he did it by the determinate counsel of God. That's what that scripture says in the book of Acts. He, he was already determined what he was gonna do before they were born, before they existed, before the world existed, that, that this... Um, this way that is God, not God's, not his possession. Because, um, okay, just think of this. If God thought up a plan and wrote it down, and it involved him in that plan, that would mean that God would be subject to the plan that he wrote down. And if something came up later, Anybody following that? <laughs> Something came up later, well, well I've got to stick with the plan. You know. That would mean the plan became God because it's controlling God. It's greater than God. Right? I mean, if uh, you've heard me say this part before. If there were ten commandments and God said, we've got to keep these ten commandments and it's not in his nature, then, but he still has to keep them then they're God because they're greater than God. They're causing God to do certain things. Well, God operates according to his being. And some of you may remember several years ago, maybe three years ago, I was really writing a lot and putting stuff down and the Lord was opening stuff. And part of what he opened to me was page after 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 page, after page on how the being of God not only determines God, but it's the only thing that's going to make a difference in us. That no amount of mental... Um, committing apart from your being, depending on how much you've been conformed to the image of Christ, in being. You understand what I'm saying? In being, not religious knowledge. I've got a lot of rig religious knowledge. Well, so did the Pharisees. And they killed Christ and didn't, and, and didn't even comprehend that that was the Son of God. We'll do the same thing. We'll miss Jesus. And we'll end up standing up, and, and trust me, in their hearts, in their sweet little pharisaical hearts, you can be assured that they were saying, we've got to do this. We've got to stand up for God. We've got to stand up for what's true that God gave us from Moses. We've got to hold to this, and we've got to keep the people to this. And so the only way to do this is this guy right over there, that, that carpenter's son, he's causing this trouble. And he's nobody. He's, he's nothing. You know? So we'll kill him. All right. 
great story, great concepts. I believe, and this is just what I believe, so you don't have to worry about it, but I believe that every one of us, one day or another, are going to be faced with either going by the knowledge of good and evil, either, either going by standing up for God, which means crucifying Jesus. Are you following me? <laughs> or, uh, if nothing else, recognizing that this could be God. And here's what I mean by that. <clears throat> and you may not know, but any time I see a situation where, you know, um, someone is overly being accused, do you understand kind of what I'm saying? Like, this is, this is over the top. I kind of go, I wonder if that's Jesus in them, in the person that's being treated that way. I mean, I do. I, 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 don't, I don't know at that stage. You see what I'm saying? I don't know. But I'm quick to go, you know what? I'd rather, I'd rather be wrong in my heart because I'm trying to not violate Christ than be right in what I think I'm doing and crucify Christ in someone, in the person of his body. So again, I started that with saying, it's the way I go about it. <clears throat> but I'm very, I'm very slow to judge now because much of the judgment has to do with what's been proven. Now I'm thinking of Jesus in the trial, what's been proven that they're wrong. You see what I'm saying? And, and how many people are saying it, thinking of Jesus' trial. <laughs> you know. I'm thinking if I was at Jesus' trial, I'd be, I mean, at a certain place in my walk and a certain level of maturity, I would have probably gone, well, yeah, crucify the guy. I mean, he's messing up our system here. God gave us this system. You know what I'm saying? But now, I would at least back off and say, Lord, I don't know, but if that's your son, in any circumstance, if, that, if that's your son, I do not want to be found going by the knowledge of good and evil and joining with a mob mentality and da 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 on and on and on. Lord, speak to me and show me what's truly Jesus. All right. I don't know why I keep getting off, off on all this stuff, but we just keep doing it. All right, a um, few more sentences here on this little area. Um, they soon saw that the cross was not the end of Christ, and it was also not a victory for their enemies. Instead, the cross, the cross was to become the symbol of him for all generations. And I was thinking about this. The other day, I was just, you know, I was in the Word and I was just studying a little bit and I was looking at some of the sacrifices. And I just, it just occurred to me when I was looking at it that, you know, when it comes to the, all the different types of offerings, you know, they offer lambs and they offer bullocks, which is young bulls and turtle dove and goats and but one of the things that they never offer is fish ever okay well you might not you know we might just go huh well they didn't offer crickets either and, you know and then wander off with that but i'm i'm going some <laughs> i'm going somewhere with this so, so stay with it he didn't offer earthworms either. Um, and that is, many people use a fish as the symbol of Christianity. And I know where it comes from. I mean, I'm not dumb, but, you know, you ought to scatter a few loaves around it if that's what you're going to use it for or whatever, you know. But even at that, even if that has nothing to do with it, 
the cross is the true symbol. Not, not a fish sign. And it is the cross and not a fish because there with that cross is the symbol of his selflessness. The thing that makes him completely different from everybody else except when you're born again and his nature comes into you and then you can be transformed. And that is the transformation, by the way. That it's no longer, you know, what is it? Uh, uh, if one man died for all, then are all dead, so that we which live should not henceforth. What is it? Seek our own, but, but his. Be about his business. And, you know, I mean, just, I'm just trying to be real here. A fish doesn't represent any of that. It has nothing to do with sacrifice. It has nothing to do with the spirit of somebody, you know, I know they did in the catacombs and we were in Rome and all that too. And, you know, in the catacombs they put a fish symbol and that, that was a secret thing so that you'd know because the persecution was so bad that they dug down into these catacomb caves and they lived in these caves that were underground to, to hide from the persecution of being a Christian which is pretty much everything we're talking about right here. And so they use that as a symbol to help know that this is one of them. I say there's something fishy about that. <laughs> uh. Speaking of earthworms. <laughs> yeah. You want me to scale it back? Is what? <laughs> okay, I'm thin. I mean, uh, <laughs> thinny. <laughs> I hope that uh, the people on this... <laughs> okay, so instead the cross was to become the symbol, and here's the key, really, really, really. Maybe the fish is the symbol of Christianity, maybe that's proper, but it's not the symbol of him. It's not the symbol of him. The cross is the one thing when God said, here's how we're going to, here's how we're going to reach people. There's going to be a cross, and you're going to die on it, and you're going to be shamefully treated. You're going to go through every ounce of it because it's your nature, and they'll never know. Um, I, I remember years ago, the Lord spoke to me. I asked him, I said, well, Lord, why, why, you know, why the cross? And he said, well, in the daily doings of what, I was doing in, in healing and all of this stuff. They just thought I was a miracle worker. They didn't see any selflessness in it, you know. Well, um, and even, even uh, statements that you read, uh, well, we're saved by the great grace of God, the great grace and mercy of God. No, we're not. We're saved by God. And it's not great grace and mercy, it's great selflessness. I mean, here's what I mean by that. That we say, so that we say the great grace and mercy, so it's like, okay, well, I'm God, and so, you know, I'm going to be merciful to you. you. In that, you see absolutely no selflessness. He didn't just become merciful to us. He didn't say, oh... You know, I changed my mind. I'm going to start being good to you. Jesus died and paid the price. He was totally selfish. So he said, he said, uh, and you know the scriptures say that he was a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. In the book of Revelation, primarily on that cross, he's a lamb, right? So in, before the world and when it's all over with, you have a lamb. 
He said, nobody would have ever really known what I was like until there was a cross. That's where they began to catch an idea of what, you know. Because just being merciful while you sit on a throne is not that big a deal. Yeah. Whales that were trapped, and this guy who was a big, industrial, he was an oil guy, came in and helped him, but it was for publicity. You know, it was like, so he was like this real merciful, wonderful guy, but it was, it was completely selfish. Right. Well, it's hard to be gracious and merciful when you're selfish. It's hard to be gracious and merciful by going to a cross and dying. Because your selfishness will not allow that. Oh, I could share some things right now the Lord's been sharing with me, but it's not even in, that's coming, and this is here, so we'll, we'll stick with this. But it's, it's, just, it's just amazing to me how the scriptures are written and put in a certain way to prove our selfishness and to prove how completely unselfish he is so that we can see a contrast and ultimately our heart yearn not for salvation from hell or for salvation from punishment but for salvation from our stinky nature you know what I'm saying our selfish self-centered nature well Again, and let me just say this, it's not, if you, if you feel that way, that for you it's no longer about just getting saved from hell or free from all of the consequences of sin or punishment by the law or any of that kind of stuff, but you desire, deeply desire Christ formed in you, that doesn't, that doesn't come by a selfish person that comes by someone who is being strongly dealt with by the Holy Spirit. Do you understand what I'm saying about you? That you would not even have those thoughts. You, you and me are too selfish to think like that. We are not too selfish to think, oh, he died, I'm glad you suffered, it was horrible for you, but I'm going to heaven! That, now that can be the height of selfishness. Amen? I mean, it, it can be, you know. But for you to want that nature and understanding what that, that will probably lead to, a thousand deaths of self-giving because you want it to be Christ, you would never come to that on your own. You wouldn't seek it. You wouldn't want it. You would run from it. Do you know people do run from this? No, no, I want to tell you. I know you don't know. <laughs> All right, let me finish out a couple of sentences here. Um, the cross would stand as the supreme object and action for all that Jesus stood for, meaning in his ministry when he walked the earth. The sum total of what he had taught during his ministry was now seen as being embodied at the cross. So that means that everything he taught would have been useless if he never manifested the spirit of that somewhere. Doesn't that make absolutely perfect sense? The cross became the, the actual proof of this reality, that this is what I believe, this is who we are. I am the expression image of the Father. This is God. This is the way God is, you know. And then I just put, he, 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 he had taught it, but now he embodied it. Yeah. Praise God. Okay, let's take a break and we'll come back.